on this Saturday night, Western Canada's deep freeze. From dangerous roads to canceled flights, how the record-breaking cold is wreaking havoc and putting people and pets at risk. Yeah, we're close to the as cold as it gets. And the massive power problems blamed on the polar vortex. Meet Taiwan's new president. How this historic win enraged Beijing. China was the number one issue. Racist or personal replica? A Montreal puppeteer's blackface controversy. Plus, swimming closer to extinction. What was well-intentioned had this unintended consequence. Why laws to protect sharks may have backfired. Global National with Farah Nasser. Good evening to you, and I hope you're joining us bundled up from inside. Canada is known to be cold, but the biting winds and bitter temperatures blanketing the West have shattered temperature records in some areas, and now that system is heading east. Weather warnings and watches cover the entire country tonight, in fact, from coast to coast to coast. Across eastern Canada, warnings and watches and travel advisories as some powerful storms move through. And then in the west, there's that sea of red where bone-chilling temperatures are sweeping across the prairies and parts of B.C., making it feel anywhere from minus 40 to minus 50 with the wind chill. The Arctic air hanging over Western Canada has been impacting everything from travel to power, even our food supply. Catherine Urquhart has the latest on the extreme cold snap. In downtown Vancouver, the deep freeze resulted in downed trolley wires and icy conditions caused chaos on countless streets. In the last few days since the temperatures dropped, roadside assistance requests have doubled. In Prince George, it plunged to minus 39 degrees, a record low. It was a similar story around the province. Some admitted they were unprepared. It came as a shock after the balmy fall we were having. Outreach teams monitored the marginalized population in Kelowna, offering them warm drinks and rolling out buses as temporary shelters. A lot of our unhoused community members, they've been able to access these warming buses, which has been incredible. Across Alberta, temperatures hit minus 40 and lower. The Siksika First Nation issued a local state of emergency, and the Alberta Energy System operator issued a grid alert as demand hit an all-time high. When we get into what's called a grid alert situation where all available supply has been used and we now need to use backup. That's when we get into a grid alert and that's when we call upon these reserves that we keep for situations like this. A 27-year-old man died after his Jeep slid into an oncoming snowplow in Calgary Friday night. For ranchers, animal safety has also been a concern. The big thing is to make sure the cattle are fed and cared for and and okay. This unusual polar vortex is causing a deep freeze in the prairies as well, and it continues to force delays and cancellations at airports across Western Canada. Catherine Urquhart, Global News, Vancouver. And now we go further west. Global News meteorologist Peter Quinlan joins me from Saskatoon. Peter, some straggling numbers out there. What's it like where you are? Farah, here in Saskatoon, temperatures have been below minus 30, wind chills from minus 40 to minus 53 since Thursday and are not expected to warm up until early next week. To the southwest in swift current, it felt like minus 59 with the wind chill this morning and wind chills have been in those minus 50s for over 24 hours. Wind chills approaching the minus 60s in Alberta this week with dozens of low temperature records broken and extreme cold warnings for all of Alberta, Saskatchewan, much of Manitoba and BC. To the east, though, we've had this winter storm bringing in heavy snow to parts of southern Ontario and Quebec. Uh, the Griffith area in Ontario has reported 30 to 40 centimeters. St. Columban in uh, southern Quebec, 31.8 centimeters. And the Ottawa Valley, uh, 15 to 27 centimeters. But the Arctic air with the polar vortex that usually sits over the North Pole that was over western Canada is shifting east, causing temperatures to plunge to uh, southern Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritime 
times, but that's going to allow some relief through western Canada where wind chills will finally clamber their way out of the minus 50s into the minus 30s on the prairies and along the west coast where they couldn't open ski resorts due to a lack of snow and warmth in December and then had to shut them down due to this cold snap. We'll finally see some relief as we head into next weekend. Could even see positive temperatures on the way, but meantime on the prairies, Farah, I have this bad tendency to leave my swim bag in the car and look what happened. My swim shorts and my uh, gym shirt are completely frozen solid. They're like cardboard. So the Arctic air impacting all aspects of life here on the prairies. Farah. Might have to dip that in the hot tub. Peter Quinlan, thanks for your forecast for us tonight from Saskatoon. South of the border, fierce winter weather continues to pummel parts of the U.S. In Iowa, frigid conditions canceled more events in the Republican presidential candidate's race ahead of Monday's caucuses. But it's done little to stop candidates from campaigning. In western New York, a dangerous winter storm has triggered a state of emergency to prepare for heavy snow and high winds this weekend. And that has affected the NFL playoffs as well, with a Sunday game between Buffalo and Pittsburgh postponed to Monday. But in Missouri, minus 20 degree temperatures are not stopping Kansas City from playing against Miami tonight. To Taiwan next, where millions of voters have rebuffed China and elected a presidential candidate from the incumbent Democratic People's Party for an unprecedented third term in office. Thousands gathered to celebrate the DPP's win today, which will extend its eight-year term in the presidential office. William Lai, the party's vice president since 2020, will be taking over the top job and will look to lead the island through a testy relationship with Beijing. David Aiken reports. An adoring crowd cheers for its new president-elect. William Lai, leader of Taiwan's Democratic People's Party, or DPP, won Saturday's election with more than 40% of the vote in a campaign where the central issue was Taiwan's relationship with mainland China. I think that this is the first time uh, since 1996 that I would say that China was the number one issue. The people have given uh, the, the current ruling party, DPP, an unprecedented third, year, uh, third term. So that's great. Uh, so that means uh, the, po the foreign policy is working. Lai is the 64-year-old son of a coal miner. He was a physician specializing in spinal cord injuries before going into politics. <laughs> the secret to his political success, a promise to stick to the status quo of walking that tightrope of avoiding anything that would provoke mainland China while maintaining Taiwan's independence of action and its defense of its own democracy. We had to win because we have to protect democracy. Indeed, that's what moved this voter. I cast my vote for Taiwan's independence, she says, for us to freely enjoy our democracy. And so it was the idea of continuing on on a good path. And people were repeating that, that slogan, and I think it, I think it was uh, convincing. I think the only people sent to the message to the Beijing is that uh, we want peace. Uh, we there there are many ways to go about it, but but ultimately nobody wants war. Beijing did not want Lai to win. It has called him a separatist and a troublemaker. And after Lai won, Beijing's Taiwan Affairs Office issued a statement saying it hoped the majority of what it called Taiwan compatriots would recognize the quote extreme harm of the DPP's. Taiwan independence line. Lai, for his part, said he is determined to safeguard Taiwan from threats and intimidation from China, but he is also willing to engage in talks with the communist government of China on the basis of what he called dignity and parity. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. The United States has carried out another airstrike on a Houthi-controlled site in Yemen overnight. U.S. officials confirmed its forces targeted a location which it considers to pose a threat to commercial vessels in the Red Sea. The strike comes just one day after British and U.S. forces targeted nearly 30 Houthi positions in Yemen while conducting fresh military drills today. The Iran-backed rebel group threatened what it called a strong and effective response to the attacks. 
President Joe Biden, meantime, said he delivered a private message to Iran today about the Houthi attacks, although he declined to go into further detail. These strikes, which were supported by Canada, have diminished hope for many of negotiating peace in the region as the Israel-Hamas war also rages on. Our Eric Sorensen spoke to one former top U.S. official on the peace effort and what these strikes could mean. Eric. Farah, the conflict in the Middle East escalated dangerously this week as a U.S.-led coalition became combatants, attacking Houthi targets in Yemen. One former State Department official believes that confrontation can be contained. I don't see that as being a front that, that has a lot of potential to, to explode. Frank Lowenstein, a former envoy on Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, says the Houthis are unlikely to muster a strong military response after the bombings by the U.S. and U.K. aircraft. But he told us on this week's The West Block that the fighting in Gaza will go on for at least three or four more months as the Israelis try to eliminate Hamas. They've killed maybe a third to a half of the Hamas fighters, and so the Israelis have no intention of backing down. I don't think this talk of a day after is, is really accurate. Still, a day after will eventually come, and Lowenstein hopes that after all the carnage, a two-state solution that includes an independent Palestinian state could eventually be achieved. Maybe the Israelis will take a step back uh, when they get done with this campaign and ask themselves, is this a sustainable way for us to live? And hopefully they'll see the light and say, okay, we have to do some things differently here in order to get Saudi normalization, in order to get support for reconstruction. But that is a long way off. First, the war has to end, and the Israeli government probably has to change. Lowenstein says a two-state solution will not happen as long as Benjamin Netanyahu is still in power. Farah? Eric Sorensen in Ottawa. Thank you, Eric. And you can watch Eric's full interview tomorrow on the West Block right here on Global. Right now, that campaign you just heard Frank Lowenstein reference shows no signs of slowing down, with dozens reportedly killed in overnight strikes in Gaza. The Gaza Health Ministry says 135 Palestinians were killed in the last 24 hours, including at least 13 members of the same family, after a strike leveled a house in the southern city of Rafah. Israeli Defense Forces say they have approved a new plan for troops in their southern command to keep pressing in what they call the enemy's territory. With the war entering its 100th day tomorrow, the IDF chief emphasized his troops' efforts have shifted from the north and are now concentrated to the center and south of the Gaza Strip. In Colombia, more than 30 people were killed after a mudslide swept onto a busy highway on Friday. This video captures the terrifying moment when part of the mountain gave way, submerging multiple cars and people who tried to run away. More than 30 others were also injured, and an unknown number of people are still missing. The clock is ticking to repay money meant to help during COVID. Coming up, how struggling small businesses are scrambling ahead of next week's SEBA loan deadline. The deadline is now less than a week away for hundreds of thousands of small businesses to repay a federal loan. The Canadian Emergency Business Account, or CBA, offered businesses tens of thousands of dollars to help with the impact of COVID shutdowns. But as the payback deadline looms, thousands are now turning to the world of independent online lenders for last-minute help. Abigail Beeman reports. We make them and offer them as rentals to the film industry. The Vancouver Art Department makes props for film and TV. Owner Grant Harrison says they were hit twice, first by COVID and then by writer and actor strikes. One day we had like 30 television shows that we were supplying uh, products to, and the next day we had zero. He took the maximum $60,000 SIBA loan, a lifeline. But he has to repay it by January 18th to keep the 20000 forgivable portion, something that just wasn't possible until... Don't get stuck at the back of the line and miss out. Apply with Merchant Growth. Harrison saw an ad like this from Merchant Growth, one of the independent lenders offering to refinance SIBA loans. At first, he was skeptical, but his bank was taking weeks to get him an appointment. He got the merchant money in a couple of days. It actually blew our minds. And the people got back to us right away and, you know, didn't ask us to... didn't ask for my firstborn and didn't ask for a mortgage. 
Founder David Jen says they get SIBA inquiries from more than a thousand businesses every day. I think it's helpful for people to know that there is a non-bank lending industry out there that uses technology, makes it really convenient, saves you time, and, and says yes a lot more often. That doesn't mean they're bad, it just means that they're different. Non-bank lenders generally charge higher interest rates for merchant growth that ranges from the low teens to low 20s. Alternatively, a business will be charged a much lower 5% by the government with three years to pay. But by not meeting the deadline, they lose up to $20,000, which could make the high interest loan cheaper and an interesting business venture, says this marketing professor. You know, there's the snake oil salesman and there's the old idea of P.T. Barnum and that people are getting swindled. Um, I think the key thing to remember here is that we have a lot of regulations in our financial sector that for the most part prevent that sort of thing going on. While the big five banks dominate, more non-traditional online lenders are popping up. Experts say due to improved technology and savings without bricks and mortar. Those low costs of entry are going to have somebody come along with, say, the killer app or the killer way that, uh, especially with young people, they're going to say, hey, I I'm not committed to the big six the way that Gen Xers and older baby boomers might be connected to the idea of traditional banking. Everyone agrees it's important to do your homework to figure out the option that's best for each business. And a lesser known but key part of the fine print, businesses can get an extension until March 28th to repay their loan and keep the forgivable portion, but only if they apply to their original bank before January 18th. A business can also apply to a third party lender as long as they've applied with their original bank too. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. Ahead, blackface backlash. Why a Montreal puppeteer is suing an anti-racism group over his own creation. A Quebec artist is launching a lawsuit against a member of an anti-racism group, accusing them of damaging his reputation. At issue, a puppet that Frank Silvestre uses for one of his performances that some have criticized as a depiction of blackface. As Mike Armstrong explains, the artist argues that his controversial prop is simply a caricature of himself. The show is called The Incredible Secret of Blackbeard. In it, artist Frank Silvestre portrays a series of characters and at one point interacts with a puppet. That was a problem for some. Sylvester says the people who criticized him never saw the show and knew nothing about it. Well, the show was supposed to be a part of Black History Month last year and performed for children as Sylvester has been doing since 2009. If I showed that to a four-year-old, it's scary. But in February of last year, several groups from the black community spoke out, calling the puppet blackface and offensive. Alain Babineau, the spokesperson for an anti-racism group, the Red Coalition, took to Twitter. He said Sylvester was an example of a black sellout who didn't want to upset his masters. Sylvester says in the fallout of that criticism, some of his performances were cancelled and he lost potential bookings. Sylvester sent a lawyer's letter to Babino last fall demanding an apology. That never came. This week he filed a lawsuit for just over $26,000 in damages. He claims the criticism was a violation of his freedom of expression and defamation. To call someone a racist when it's unreasonable to do so, when you have no good reason to do so, that's defamation. Babino and the Red Coalition are calling the lawsuit frivolous. In a statement, they say critics were expressing their disapproval and that the puppet plays on historic stereotypes depicting black people as grotesque, dim-witted, lazy, buffoonish, cowardly, superstitious, and overly cheerful. Well, Sylvester says it's just supposed to be an exaggerated version of himself. He says he's been using the puppet for more than 20 years. What's changed, he says, is the climate, where instead of listening to our Artists, people try to cancel them. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Montreal. Next, unintended result. Why banning the practice of shark finning might be pushing the ocean predators closer to extinction. 
Sharks have long been perceived as the apex predator of the seas. Yet despite their reputation, a new study found that human activity is still the biggest threat to these animals. And it's also a frank assessment over whether efforts to protect them, like banning shark finning, have worked at all. Heidi Pachachik explains. Always fascinating, often feared, sharks are powerful ocean predators, but new research finds fishing by another predator, us, is killing more of them. Despite a tenfold increase of regulations that are supposed to protect sharks from overfishing, um, we do not see a global decline in the mortality of sharks. The study in the journal Science determined shark mortality from fishing increased in a seven-year period, reaching 101 million killed in 2019. More than 30% of those sharks threaten species, many caught unintentionally, even in our own waters. Sharks still get caught as bycatch in a lot of our directed fisheries, and we should have figured out how to address shark bycatch um, in our fisheries in this country. Since the 1990s, many jurisdictions have prohibited shark finning, hacking off the fins and discarding the carcass. Some, including Canada, later required any shark landed to have fins attached. And then almost five years ago, Canada became the first G20 country to ban fin imports. But researchers found in the end, demand for shark only increased. Harvesters finding new markets for the whole fish. So what was well-intentioned and the right thing to do had this unintended consequence of making the shark trade more valuable. Shark oil found in cosmetics, cartilage in supplements, in many countries, people rely on shark meat because it's affordable. Changing the cultural aspect of, especially like uh, coastal communities that have been eating that for so long, uh, it's also really hard. So while banning shark finning was a start. What reduces overall mortality is uh, catch restrictions, protected areas, and phasing out particularly indiscriminate fishing gears like gill nets. Better ways, he says, to save shark species facing extinction. Heidi Petrachik, Global News, Halifax. And that's Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Farai Nasser. On behalf of our whole crew here, I want to thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is this snowy owl chilling near Calgary. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night.